We are a cooperative species. We dominate the entire planet thanks to our abilities to cooperate. And that's very puzzling because we're also very selfish. So why do we cooperate? We're a social species. We have lived in groups for at least half a million years, during which we became more and more dependent on one another. And when we interact, we realize we could attain something greater when we collaborate. But at the same time, we experience this tension between what's good for me and what's good for all of us. Take, for example, doing chores at home. I like it better when the others take care of that, while I save my energy for something more interesting. But if everyone in my family thinks that way, then nothing gets done. And these types of dilemmas are everywhere, from deciding whether or not to recycle, to taking the car or the bike to work, to budget allocations in organizations and political arms races, what all these dilemmas have in common is that they create conflict. Now, from an evolutionary point of view, natural selection would have favored individuals who favor self-interest, because that would increase their survival chances. And also, economic models portray a rational agent as a homo economicus who maximizes self-interest. But despite this strong temptation to defect, we cooperate readily. We share with one another, we give to each other, seemingly without getting anything in return. So tonight, I want to present some ideas that my colleague Christophe Bonne and I wrote up in a forthcoming book, and we propose that our brain is wired with two routes to cooperation, one driven by self-interest, the other one by group inclusion. And that gives us a double nature. We are compassionate egoists, and we're constantly hovering between wanting what's good for me and wanting to see the group prosper. These two routes to cooperation are ecologically rational. And I borrowed a term from Gerd Gigerenzer to explain how real minds work. Now, our brain is a limited information capacity device. And if it would be unwise to use an infinitely long information search to make decisions, and instead, evolution has endowed us with a set of simple decision rules or heuristics that help us solve recurrent problems based on a few important features of the environment. That's what ecological rationality is all about. It's about making sound, satisfactory decisions instead of trying to reach the impossible optimal. So on average, heuristics improve decision-making and they're more efficient, but they don't take over decision-making and when they're used outside of the environment in which they were designed to operate, they might actually lead us astray and be prone to error. And I'll return to that point later. Now, the heuristics that facilitate these two routes to cooperation were shaped throughout evolution to fulfill two basic fundamental human motives. The first motive is to serve self-interest. And it was shaped by natural selection, actioning on the individual, and it shaped behavior to be selfish. Unless there are cooperative incentives to not be selfish, to cooperate. And that leads to the first decision rule. Be selfish unless there are cooperative incentives. The second decision rule is to fulfill the motive of group inclusion and to fulfill our desire to belong. And it was shaped by natural selection, by kin selection and gene culture co-evolutionary pressures to have humans maintain affiliative bonds with those we care for and to facilitate cooperation for the well-being of the group. But it's unlikely that evolution would have created our behavior to be self-destructive. So if we're going to cooperate for the sake of the group, 
We want to make sure that our cooperative efforts will not be compromised, so we look for trust signals. And that leads to the second decision rule. Be cooperative unless your partner is untrustworthy. Now, as long as group interest coincides with personal interest, there is no conflict of motives, and these two heuristics will lead to the same behavior. For example, if you get a tax deduction for donating to charity, now why it pays to be generous. But mostly, pursuing self-interest jeopardizes our social inclusion because people don't like us to be selfish. And vice versa, some people want to belong so much they hurt themselves in the process. And when there is a conflict of motives like that, then whether or not I'm going to decide to which decision rule I'm going to abide by will depend on social values. Do I like economic benefits better or do I like group inclusion more? And schematically, it looks like this. Social values reflect how much we care about other people compared to ourselves. And they contrast the pro-social people versus the more greedy ones, the pro-selves. And these social values are a compass in decision-making because they guide our attention towards either trust signals in the environment or cooperative incentives. Pro-socials are naturally already cooperative, so they care a lot about trust signals to make sure they won't be betrayed when they cooperate. Whereas pro-selves scan the environment for cooperative incentives. They want to know what's in it for me. Now, these cooperative incentives can be rewards for good behavior, like the tax deduction for donating to charity, but it can also be the fruits from a long-term reciprocal beneficial relationship. Or they can be reputation benefits, because we all tend to cooperate more when we know we're being watched, because at that time we know our reputation is at stake. These cooperative incentives and trust signals, they're processed by regions in the brain that I've conveniently labeled under the umbrella term social cognition and cognitive control. And these regions, they modulate the valuation system or the reward system of the brain where rewards of different entities are compared. Now, do I like the warm glow of giving better or do I like the steady bank account? And depending on the anticipated reward, I will decide to cooperate or not. Now, we tested this proposition in a population of 322 students. And we found, indeed, in the upper graph, that trust signals increase the cooperative behavior of pro-socials and that they have absolutely no impact on the pro-selves. We manipulated trust by having half the participants meet prior to the experiment so they could get to know each other and the other half which, with whom we compared their behavior, stayed just plainly anonymous. And then we manipulated cooperative incentives. And we did that by having the participants play two different economic games that varied in payoff structure. One game elicited a strong temptation to defect, and the other game gave cooperative incentives. And there we found that the cooperative incentives impacted especially the cooperative behavior of the pro-selves. Now, note in the lower, gra lower graph that everybody tends to cooperate more when cooperative incentives are present, but their impact is greatest on the pro-selves, who cooperate very little without them. Then we repeated this, this last experiment with the incentives under the fMRI scanner, and we found again that the pattern of neural activation in the brain differed in accordance with social values. For pro-selves, we found more activations in those cognitive control regions, which is consistent with the finding that pro-selves adapt their behavior when incentives are present or not. And for pro-socials, we found more activation in a region of the brain that had previously been associated with routine moral judgments. So to recapitulate, our paradoxical nature can be traced back to the brain which helps us to decide to cooperate when it is lucrative, making it economically rational, or when there's sufficient trust signals so we know we're not going to be betrayed. 
making it socially rational. And in addition to these different brain regions that sustain these two routes to cooperation, different neurochemicals may be involved as well. And especially oxytocin may be interesting in this respect. Oxytocin is a hormone which is produced naturally by our bodies, and it has an important role, or its primary role is in reproduction. In women, it initiates birth, and it's released during lactation, during which time it strengthens the mother-infant bond. But a search of recent experiments in economics and psychology have shown that oxytocin can also promote bonding and trusting in more distantly related people. However, the effect of oxytocin on cooperative behavior is not unconditional. And in one of our experiments, we found that oxytocin actually increases the cooperative behavior of, with a partner, but only if the partner is a familiar other person, someone that you met before. And if the partner is anonymous, then oxytocin actually significantly decreased cooperation. And other experiments have shown that oxytocin promotes favoritism, or what we call parochial behavior. It increases cooperation with in-group members, but sometimes at the detriment of an out-group. And even more interesting is that oxytocin may also promote ethnocentric behavior. When inhaling three puffs of oxytocin, someone named Louis was found to cooperate more with Mark and Anthony, but not with someone named Ismail or Said. So this parochial behavior is one of the first signs that cooperation heuristics may break down when they're used outside of the domain in which they were designed to operate, which is a small, isolated group. Now, people form groups really easily based on seemingly trivial characteristics. And social psychology experiments have corroborated over and over again that people have a clear preference to cooperate with in-group members, that they show in-group favoritism. And this in-group favoritism or parochial behavior may have been very advantageous to our ancestors in the Pleistocene who lived in small, isolated groups. On two accounts, by showing their loyalty to the in-group and discriminating against an out-group, they help the group win the competition. And if the group wins the competition, they win economically because they share the loot. They share in the economic gains, gains of a group that wins. But they also win socially, because through a shared social identity with the group, a winning group may boost your self-esteem, your sense of self-worth. And that may make you value the group even more. People value group belonging beyond the economic benefits that they can expect from them. Soccer fans, for example, they don't share in the wealth of their team. They just like to see their team win. They want to be part of the clan. And pay, people pay dues to belong to churches, to support groups. And what they get in return is not money, but a sense of social security, a sense of shared identity. And a strong social identity shifts the self-image from I to us, and it intertwines personal well-being with the well-being of the group. But when social identity is threatened, that creates an us versus them mentality. And that is what we're currently experiencing with groups that are divided across religious or political ideologies. And when they become radical, they, their pro-social decisions are not necessarily virtuous anymore. So how to counteract parochialism, in-group favoritism, and ethnocentric behavior? Clearly, if we want to sustain cooperation on a more global scale, beyond boundaries, then cooperation heuristics are not sufficient. And neither are pro-social values because they do temper greed, and that's good, and parents and schools know that, and they spend a lot of time and effort canalizing their youth's value to be norm-compliant. 
But these same pro-social values that help our children find their role in society and identify with society make them prone to favoritism and parochialism. Now, in societies that are large, like ours, where boundaries are diffuse, it seems that one way to, or one antidote for parochial behavior and for ethnocentric behavior is to use conscious, deliberate reasoning. What do I mean by that? Well, we can cultivate our awareness of belief biases and trade them for logical analysis. We can exert impulse control and repress the urge for a small reward now in favor of a larger one in the future. And when we regret something, we can reflect on the values that caused the regret in the first place and perhaps change paths if that's necessary. Ironically, all these examples tap the neural networks of cognitive control, which I earlier associated with selfishness and economic rationality. So economic rationality is not all bad, and social rationality is not always virtuous. These are heuristics that operate without valence. They're relics that we inherited from our ancestors. And if we're going to use them today, we better do so with a healthy dosis of reasoning. Thank you.